Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mansouri Fahimi. I'm a postdoc here at Queen, Qu Queen Square Institute of Neurology, working with Vladimir Litvak, and I will be giving the lecture today on MEG and EEG source analysis. Um, so to get started, I will just give an overview of all the topics that we will be covering, but then at the end of the lecture, I will also talk a little bit about all the, the topics that we haven't really covered in this lecture. Um, so in the first instance, I will just explain a little bit about what source reconstruction also known as inverse modeling, also known as source analysis, is and what it means in the context of MEG and EEG data, why this is useful, so why people use it, what's the advantage, what's um, the applications, how we actually solve this in practice. Um, these are by two main steps can uh, get comprised first for solving the forward model and then the inverse model. Um, and then we will go to, go to talk a little bit about how this is done specifically in, in SPM. So what SPM's approach is, is to um, use a Bayesian formulation towards to solve the inverse problem. Um, and then we will also talk a bit about what this gives us. So how this provides a, basically a very powerful framework with which to do model comparison and hypothesis testing. So to get started, what is inverse modeling? So in um, as you if you have experience with collecting MEG and EG data, you know that what you collect is basically sensor measurements on the scalp. So you will collect data from, from the surface of the head. But what you're really interested in is basically seeing the sources on so where these sources come from, what source, what where where these source where the activity is generated from. Uh, and this can be visualized as you can see on the on the on the right, uh, either on the MRI or in a model of the mesh, as you can see uh, here below. And this is basically what we try to do when we want to do inverse modeling. So why, um, uh, so just to give also another example um, of what we actually do when we do inverse modeling. So here I've just created a dummy example of, I've generated some um, sources in the scalp, so every, in, the, in the head. So every time they're in the same location, somewhere deep in the head. Uh, and I've generated three different types of sources um, and each of them are oriented. So the, the direction of the vector with which we uh, model the source, source um, is pointed in a different direction. And you can see that each of these different directions or orientations uh, really generates a topographical map. So basically a map of what we measure on the sensor level uh, that looks very different from the others. And so that this is a bit of an example to show you also a little bit how, how these different things look, but also to say that when we do inverse modeling, we're interested in basically inferring three different things. And that is the orientation of our source, the amplitude and also uh, its location. So why is this useful and why do people do it? I think there's a, there is an obvious reason, as I mentioned, is basically because you're interested in dis disentangling the sources and estimating the location, amplitude or orientation for various reasons. Um, but I think there's other benefits that are maybe m mentioned less um, that I wanted to point out. Uh, first of all, I think it, it is a very useful technique also to increase the signal to noise ratio of your um, source or, or signal of interest. Um, and in some cases, it can even be used as basically a method to um, remove artifacts that you're not interested in that are coming out from outside the head, for example. And one of uh, a very nice example is, I think, a study from Oswald in 2016, where they were interested in looking at sources um, that were modulated uh, by deep brain stimulation, so by uh, implanting electrodes deep in the, the head and giving electrical stimulation. And obviously, they weren't interested in the electrical stimulation itself, which was causing quite a lot of artifact, but by using a source, a, a type of source modeling called beam forming, they were able to um, remove the artifacts from the electrical stimulation quite well. So I think this is a very powerful example to show where source modeling can also be used to remove artifacts that you're not interested in. Uh, another example, I think, um, another reason I think it's nice to do this is to increase basically the interpretability, interpretability of your results. And also it, it allows, for example, to do a lot of group comparison. Um, so for example, here, um, if you have sensor measurements from different subjects um, and you're interested in analyzing all the EG data that you have, all the EG and EMG data, but you happen to record from electrodes in different locations or different types of electrodes, um, 
or interested in, for example, combining different modalities, even from EG and MEG. So um, in, um, in this example, you can see you, the electrodes are not in the same place. Um, there are some methods where you can do this, where you can try to combine this at the, the sensor level. Uh, you can do interpolation of the sources, but a very straightforward way, I think, is when you you just convert everything to the source space and that makes it quite more much more comparable. And then, as I mentioned, of course, is the obvious reason when you're actually interested in inferring the sources because you're interested in the location um, and amplitude of orientation. And this also facilitates a, a, a rich repertoire of different types of analysis like you, that you can do, for example, looking at brain networks or functional connectivity is much more um, meaningful to do on the source level because it increases the spatial resolution uh, between your sources. And there's a lot of clinical examples um, where this is useful. Um, okay, so there are quite some, there are some clinical applications to why you want to do source localization. I think it's mostly common in the context of epilepsy where you're interested in finding the source of your epileptic uh, seizure to resect that for surg during surgery. But there's all other clinical applications in, in autism um, um, for sleep disorders. I've seen people do it to localize brain, brain tumors. Um, it's sometimes used. So there, there is a range of clinical applications that are um, that are available as well. And of course, in scientific and cognitive neuroscience, it's quite popular to try and do source localization um, to test different hypotheses. So, um, so with that introduction, uh, let's get to the actual um, theory of how to do it. So, um, as I mentioned, there is a forward model and there's an inverse model. And what these two mean is basically to map from the source level, uh, so where the dipoles are located in uh, your cortex, um, and to map from that to where you're measuring it on the on the on the sensor level, that is called the forward mapping, and then the opposite is obviously called the inverse mapping. So you cannot do the inverse mapping, the inverse modeling, which is what you're actually interested in, without doing the forward forward modeling. So you need to have an idea of how the electric or magnetic fields are actually conducted to the sensor level before you can try and attempt to do the opposite. Um, and in practice, there's a lot of details to how to do this forward map mapping. A lot of the um, information on biology and neuronal activity and neuroanatomy that you've had in the lecture on the first day is of relevance here. So how neuronal um, activity are conducted, how they are generated. Um, there is a lot of details that can go into uh, designing this, these forward models, um, vessels, um, cerebrospinal fluid, the um, um, yeah, maybe it's better in the the conductivity and geometry of of the cortex and is is all relevant. Um, in practice, a lot of these details is ignore are ignored because um, you can still do the forward modeling by making some simplifying assumptions, and um, it's also quite difficult to actually measure these conductivities in vivo in different people. So it might be different for different people, and it's quite impossible to, to measure these um, in vivo, so they actually ignore them uh, for most of the time. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that the forward model or the head model is actually computed by solving the Maxwell equations um, that describe how electrical and magnetic fields are uh, generated and how they conduct. Um, in practice, these are simplified a lot for solving this particular problem because we can assume that the hat has no capacitance quality and it's purely resistive, or at least within the frequency range of interest that we are working with, which is below one kilohertz, far below one kilohertz. This is this is um, widely known to be true. Therefore, um, the quasi-static approximations of Maxwell of of the Maxwell equations make make it fairly straightforward or simple, uh, relatively speaking, to solve this problem. So basically, the L, which is the head model or the lead field, um, is what we obtain by solving the forward problem. I also wanted to, so this is, um, again, another slide about the lead fields or the head model. So I just wanted to say um, Maxwell equations because they're simplified. Uh, if we make some very simplifying assumptions about what we how we think the head model looks like, so for example, very simple cases like a single sphere or using different types of spheres to fit within the shape of the head, 
Um, there is analytical solutions possible for these very simplistic cases. Um, in more general cases, you might require numerical solutions, such as, for example, the boundary element model or the finite element model, and these can get as complicated as, as you would want them to, basically. Um, um, and in most cases, they use rarely um, simple models like the tree sphere model, which is good for a lot of practical examples. I also wanted to note for yeah, that you can use the same uh, model for MEG and EG, um, but it might be more relevant to use more accurate head models for EG, where the electrical fields are actually um, actively affected by the medium through which they conduct, which is not so true for magnetic fields. Um, if you're interested in more information about different types of head models, I would refer you to chapter 28 of the SPM book, which has a lot of explanation about how to solve these different lead fields. Um, and as a last slide, I just wanted to point out, as I mentioned, that there's really no limit to how detailed you can go, and people have been looking into that. Uh, a very nice, I think, um, quite extreme example is um, a study where they included all the vessels and arteries um, under the skull scalp um in in the head model so this is this is i think a very um interesting study to show how much details really can go into the design of the head model and something maybe more relevant for some of people some of the people who are interested in clinical applications is um skull openings or burr holes that are generated after um brain surgery um also really affect the conductivity of these different layer layers and how that affects the uh, the accuracy of your source localization can also be relevant for a lot of you. So that's also quite nice that, to see that there are people looking into that. And there's another paper I referenced here if you're interested in, in, a, uh, in a really comprehensive comparison between these different types of head models. Um, also, um, the difference, so as you can see, I've also noted, so if, if for EG and MEG, as you know, they, they will create different, dipoles will create different uh, lead fields. So you um, so if you have different types of lead fields, you can know based on the difference of the electric and magnetic fields that the dipoles will be um, orthogonal to each other. So the same lead field observed in EG and MEG will lead us to infer different orientations of the dipoles. But I do want to mention a caveat that this doesn't necessarily mean that if you see a lead field uh, in EG or MEG, that you can infer from that what the lead field, what the exact same lead field would look like in the MEG, because um they aren't actually so eg and meg aren't actually sensitive to exactly the same type of sources so there are there will be some differences in measuring the same um activity or the same paradigm when you measure it with eg or or meg okay so that was um uh, covering the forward models, and now we want to get to uh, solving the inverse problem. Um, here is this, this slide is to show you a little bit the three main uh, sort of directions that people go into, uh, the three main types of um, methods that people use to solve the inverse problem. There's different types of algorithms, and uh, I would take this sort of spectrum with a with a grain of salt because it's not it, it's not exactly um, what I. Um, that they are on three different um, ranges of the spectrum, but it's a bit of a good example to say that um, what they what they really mean. So, in equivalent current dipoling or equivalent dipole modeling, we're assuming that the the sources are coming from one or or a limited number of places in the in the brain, and we want to infer the location or orientation or amplitude of these different sources. Whereas on the other extreme, uh, instead you're assuming the whole brain to be basically active, to be a, a place for a potential source, and you're trying to so you divide the whole brain into a number of of possible sources and the objective becomes to infer the amplitude and orientation of each of these different uh, tiny little compartments of your brain. Um, and beamformer modeling is sort of an in-between space because it's um, um, it's basically trying, so it's a, a, a model that tries to um, maximize the signal to noise ratio of a particular type of, a particular region of interest um, that you've defined while trying to minimize the signal to noise ratio everywhere else. So it's sort of an in-between, but not exactly. Um, and that's 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 the three main types of models that you will um, see in the literature. Um, and that's that's how people do it. And the, 
Um, so what I wanted to now say is that um, in SPM, the source localization, so you can have all of these different models uh, also formulated in a Bayesian way. Here, we're going to focus on the distributed source modeling, so the linear mappings of the source modeling, and describe how this can be solved within a Bayesian framework, which is how SPM approaches this problem. So for that, we need a little bit of um, equations, but I will take you through it. So if you bear with me, um, uh, then it will become quite clear how this is actually done. Um, so just in the first line, you can see that there is a linear mapping from the sources to, so defined as J, to the sensor uh, measurement defined as Y, and, and this linear mapping goes through the forward modeling, the lead fields, um, or the head model defined as, as L. So Y is equal to L multiplied by J plus an error term. So Y is our measurement data, which is sensors by time. L is the head model, so sensors by sources. And J are the sources, so sources by time. Um, and in this Bayesian approach, we've also assumed that the noise and, so, uh, and the sources are zero mean Gaussians with a covariance um, of Q of E and Q respectively. So um, within the Bayesian framework, you basically assume that your source distribution um, it, it, the, is, is equal to the expected value of the probability uh, of these sources given, given your measurements. Um, and as you've seen in the previous lecture, uh, this can be solved by uh, solving the Bayes theorem or the Bayes rule. And this, this rule I've repeated here again in this slide. So our, the probability of our sources given by the data that we've measured is can, uh, is uh, the posterior that I've, I've, I've put here. Um, and using Bayes' uh, rule, you can see that this is equivalent to the likelihood, which is basically the, um, the probability of data given your sources, so how we expect the um, the source the sources to conduct to the to the measurement level, uh, multiplied by your prior belief of how these sources are distributed on the brain, um, divided by the evidence of the of the data. But this is something that we will neglect in solving this equation because it's a, a, it's mostly a constant value. So if you neglect that in the next slide, then you can see that the um, probability of the sources given your data uh, is related to uh, the likelihood multiplied by your prior beliefs. And as I mentioned, because we have assumed that these are Gaussian um, um, variables with zero mean and covariance matrix Q of E and Q, this uh, can be solved by the following equation that you can see. So um, E to the power of this equation that you he see here. Um, and you can show that if you, if so to try and maximize this, you take the derivative of this equation by taking the derivative of the log. This is mostly just um, some mathematics that they do to make it more straightforward to solve. And you can see these details by looking both at the SPM books and by uh, the papers that I've referenced in the, at the end of the slide. But once you solve this, um, then you will come to the la final equation that I've put here on the slide to show that basically source distribution is the result of a, a linear set of weights. Um, that is this equation multiplied by the data. Um, and and. And so you can see that the set of weights is a function of, of course, the lead field, but also the two um, covariance matrices that we've defined before. So the covariance of the sources and the covariance of the noise. And this is the important part that I wanted to get to. So basically what it boils down to, what the solution of the inverse modeling boils down to within the Bayesian framework is basically, you already have the L, that's that's what you gained from the forward modeling that you, that you have done before. So now you, you everything boils down to the assumptions that you have on the noise and source covariance. Um, and all of the things that we will be explaining in the next few, in the next slides and the rest of the talk is basically, um, how do you define these different um, assumptions on the noise and source covariance um, and, and, and what the different, so every different algorithms are basically different assumptions on these covariance matrices. And these are also your so your prior beliefs on how the sources and the noise is distributed. So as I mentioned, there's there are two now covariances that you need to um, make some assumptions on. So one is a noise covariance. Um, and you can have different types of uh, covariances that you define for this in case of 
MEG data, it's sometimes convenient to use just empty room record recordings as an estimate of your noise. Um, people can also use pre-stimulus um, covariance. So if you have, for example, an event-related potential, use resting state um, uh, noise covariance to, to estimate the noise. Um, in cases where you don't have any prior assumptions from the data, you can also just use an uh, identically distributed um, so just uh, an identity matrix. And this can also sometimes be seen as a regularization or a hyperparameter. But what is, I think, more interesting is how you define your uh, prior source covariance, which is basically your belief for how uh, the sources are distributed. And this is why we make all of these assumptions are uh, mathematically defined. This is basically your belief for for how the underlying activity is generated um, so in the most simple case uh, you have an id so an identity matrix that you define for your source covariance and this is basically saying that you believe that all the sources are identically distributed there is no particular place where you expect the, strong, the source to be stronger or weaker and this is represented as a source covariance matrix that is the identity um, a little bit so this this can this can be a good uh, assumption. Uh, in some cases, people say, well, we know the brain is not necessarily working that way. It's sort of a bit more smooth and, and spread out. And in that case, instead of just taking an identity matrix, you can take a bit of a smoothed identity matrix where, where there is some, some local coherence between the sources that are closer nearby. And this um, taking a source covariance matrix like this um, is usually called taking it, it, it is is uh, is usually uh, called maybe e loretta or s loretta or local coherence um, these are different algorithms that are basically saying um, we we assume this sort of smoothness or flatness on the source covariance um, and then and then you know there is there is many different types of assumptions that you can make on the source um, there is many different types of prior information that you can also take just from, 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 from data or from measurements or from literature that you have. You can even take um, a prior beliefs on the sources that are active from, from fMRI data that you have. Um, and these different um, assumptions have different names, different groups have historically given different acronyms and different names to different types of assumptions, but that's basically what defines the different algorithms of source modeling. So I just want to just to let that sink in. I just want to give this is maybe a bit of a repetition of, of what, I, what I've already said, but just to make it more clear uh, what is actually happening when we do these uh, use these generative Bayesian models to do the source uh, modeling. So if you have, for example, um, uh, so you have your measured data that is Y, then you, you use a prior information on your source covariance. And in this example, you can say you can assume, well, I only think that there is one particular source that's active in the in the source space. So I define my covariance matrix to be to be uh, having only one dipole that is active, and then you use that to make your prediction, which is the J that I showed in the um, the J hat that I showed in the previous slide, and that will give you uh, a measure of data that is the predict that is what you predict, and that is then that would then be your posterior, and then you can always either fit, either check if that's correct with some sort of model comparison or some sort of um, other methods that you have to to check the performance of this model. And this is this is, for example, a single dipole fit. As you can see in this example, our assumptions were not really very well because your prediction and what you're actually measuring look very far off from each other. But in another example, if you now uh, make a better prediction of or a better assumption of where you think this this source is located, then you can see that your prediction and your measured measurement are actually quite closer. And in different types of um, assumptions, so for example here, if you assume that two sources are active, then you can still see that the prediction does quite well. Um, other assumptions, this is something we've already covered before. So the minimum norm is where you assume your source covariance to be the identity matrix. Uh, and you can see that uh, compared to the dipole fit, it's a little bit more spread out, but not, um, yeah, I don't have the, I didn't have the e Loretta here, but that, then you could see that it was even more smoothed. Um, another 
popular, uh, another very popular uh, type of inverse modeling is the beamformer, as I've as I've mentioned, and this is where you take your uh, prior information or your prior beliefs from from empirical measurements from your actual measurements which will then give you more information of how those sources are distributed and then you can see that uh, the predicted value also looks quite close to what you've actually measured and this is also something that i've covered before um so if if you have some assumptions uh, if or if you have some fmri data for example that um helps you make some assumptions of where you think the sources of your particular experiment are coming from then you can also include those um, in your in your prior beliefs um, it's also of course always it's always a bit tricky because um, fmri and eg are not necessarily measuring the same thing um, but but this, these are prior beliefs so it's not so you're basically telling your algorithm it's possible that these are also active sources it's not that you're limiting other places but you're just allowing the um, algorithm to have stronger beliefs about that particular type of location and the reason I mentioned these different type of algorithms is because I wanted to introduce a final very interesting um, method which is the multiple sparse priors um, and in this particular algorithm um, you have a library of different assumptions that you can combine to uh, generate your prior information on the source covariance so you can it's 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 all it's basically a generalization of of the different methods that you've had before um, and you can optimize this by different ways and um, taking by taking the sum of multiple prior components you're generating one very strong um, prior belief on your source covariance um, and you will see a demo of how, how all of this is implemented in SPM later on in the next lecture, but I also just wanted to show you where these are in these different types of algorithms that are impl implemented in SPM. So uh, minimum, uh, uh, minimum norm, um, Loretta that we covered, uh, the empirical base and the multiple sparse priors, which has different algorithms to basically solve um, these, these um, to, to generate the optimal posterior. Okay, so that was um, how inverse modeling do is done within the Bayesian framework and how different source covariance matrices, so different assumptions on the source covariance give us different results and how these different um, uh, models or different assumptions basically give gen make for different types of algorithms. But I think one of the very nice things about um, uh, doing it this way is that it also provides a very powerful framework to compare your models and it's also this is very useful so for, if you want to if you don't know really how to choose your priors then um, how do you decide which algorithm to use um, which one will work best so it's it's important to know how you can actually compare um, what criteria you can actually have to compare these different models and priors and to decide which one is best so in this example, I just wanted to say, um, see, show you all of these different types of algorithms together. So if you have, as you saw in the previous example, an incorrect prior, a correct prior, uh, that is the ground truth, but also the beamformer or minimum norm, then these predicted values will um, have the measurements, as you can see in the bottom row. Um, and these different measurements or predicted values um, will have different percentages of the variance of the original data that they explain. And this can could be used as one uh, criteria or one particular way to compare um, the performance of your algorithm. So the higher the covariance, for example, the higher the accuracy. But as you can see in the example, the ground truth is actually explaining less covariance than the other models such as the beamformer and the minimum norm um, and the reason for that is that um, in it is is, is simple is simply because um, you have in the beamformer and minimum norm um, also defined a prior on your on your noise and as you can see that uh, the predicted value for those two algorithms is also for trying to fit the noise uh, whereas the ground truth isn't and that creates for a high, higher variance explained. So does that actually mean that those are working better because is, is fitting the noise something you're actually interested in? So it's it, this is to show you that the variance explained is not necessarily always a good way to compare models. Um, and, and within the Bayesian framework, 
um, there is a, a, a another way to 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 do this model comparison, mm -hmm. and that is by uh, calculating the free energy or log model evidence for well the free energy for um, these different types of algorithms. And if you do that, then you can see that the ground truth, which is the strong the closest to your original solution, is actually having the free energy. So by maximizing the free energy or choosing the model that has the ma maximum free energy. Um, you have a strong way of choosing which algorithm is best. And so what is this free energy exactly and how can you compute it? So there is a lot of information about um, what free energy is in the context of a lot of different types of methods, for example, for GLM, for DCM. Within the context of source localization, um, you're interested in maximizing something that has the highest accuracy of your model whilst at the same time having the least amount of complexity um, and how you do that uh, i have refrained from bringing the entire equation here because i don't think that is too relevant for you to know to understand what the free energy is actually doing i just wanted to give you a bit of an intuition so if you um have some hyperparameters on your noise covariance and some hyperparameters on your source covariance. That's what gave you that uh, prior belief. So the covariance of basically com the combination of parameters that gives you that prior belief and covariance on your sources, uh, on your uh, source and noise. And then you have the covariance of your actual measurement of your data. Then the free energy boils down to the error of the model, so the difference between these these different covariances, the size of your model covariance, the number of your data samples, um, and um, you, the error in the hyperparameters or the covariant and the covariance of the hyperparameters that you've chosen. And so, by trying to minimize this equation by way of taking derivative in different ways, you can try to minimize, basically find the best fit, the best hyperparameters and the best priors that will uh, solve your method, your 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 source inverse source modeling. Um, and as I said, this is uh, trying to maximize the accuracy while trying to minimize the complexity. And the accuracy is uh, reflected in the first three terms of this equation, while the complexity is the second two. Um, and if this is unfamiliar for you, it might be more, uh, you might be better, you might be more familiar with um, different types of criteria that people have used. So for example, the Akaike information criterion or uh, Bayesian criterion, information criterion. Um, there is differences between those and what the free energy is. I think one of the key differences is in how the complexity term is defined. Uh, so I think free energy is, is doing that a little bit differently. There are different studies that look into the comparing of these, um, but in SPM, what is implemented is the free energy to compare models. Um, so that was it. Um, to give you a summary of all the things that we've covered. So as I mentioned, you need the solution of the forward problem, even if it's an approximation, to be able to solve the inverse problem, which is what you're actually interested in. Um, a lot of biological information goes into um, the assumptions that you make about forward models, so all the uh, details of anatomy, of generation of electrical and uh, magnetic fields is used and useful to solve the forward model that gives you the head model. The inverse model is then solved using this head model. And you also make additional, additional assumptions on the configuration of the source, of these sources. And within the Bayesian formulation, this translates to prior information that you have on the noise and source covariance. Um, I also wanted to note that um, source covariance is obviously quite a big matrix, but in practical, uh, implementation there are ways to make this smaller um so to make this this the solving of this um of this of this of these algorithms easier uh, the different ways that you use to formulate the prior source and noise covariance is what makes these different algorithms different um so if you see different names and terms that basically means that they have different assumptions of how they think the sources are distributed and within the bayesian formulation you have a nice framework where you can compare your models to choose which priors you think are best or for example test the hypothesis of a scientific hypothesis that you have um, by minimizing by by maximizing the free energy um 
so of obviously in this course we're interested we will be presenting SPM and all of this is implemented in SPM. Um, uh, there is also an additional toolbox that in uh, called Dice that um, has some additional um, source reconstruction models. Um, we will not cover that within the main theoretical days, but this will there will be a lecture um, in the in the last day. Um, giving a tutorial on how to use this. There are other software packages available in MATLAB. There is Fieldtrip and Brainstorm, which are very powerful methods to use this, but they are not implemented um, in a Bayesian formulation. And in Python, you also have MNE. Um, as I mentioned, there are quite a lot of topics that we didn't cover. Um, so the demo that will be coming next after this talk, Dice Toolbox will be on the last day. Um, I also wanted to say that there's a, a lot of practical details in the implementation that we haven't really talked about. So um, um, there are ways to to reduce the head model um, by making um, by by reducing dimension in the spatial and temporal space. Um, a lot of steps in pre-processing, um, how to actually do and optimize these models, how they're actually implemented. A lot of these details might not be relevant if you're just interested in, in implementing it because it's just all under the hood of SPM and it will do a lot of that stuff for you. Um, but some details might be quite relevant and they come from experience. So um, in case you have any trouble implementing, there is very active SPM mailing list that can always help. Mm. Uh, another other few things. So. Obviously, in SBM, um, people are interested in Bayesian implementation, but we haven't really covered how non-Bayesian source reconstruction or spatial filters work. You can find these from other software packages. DICE is also not implemented in Bayesian, so that would, might be interesting for you. Um, we're not the only software definitely available um, that um, does source localization within a Bayesian framework. There are very interesting developments um, outside of SPM um, that also try to quantify these uncertainties and source localization performances within a Bayesian framework, but not using free energy. So there's quite some interesting studies. Um, you can do group reconstruction um, within SPM, but that's also not something that we've talked about here. Um, and lastly, uh, we've talked mostly about free energy as a, as a method to compare your models and quantify performance, but there are definitely a multitude of other ways to do that and to look at spatial resolution or um, crosstalk. And there are very nice examples in the literature. One per personal uh, favorite I've put in the references for you to see. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, there's a lot of references. I will definitely suggest taking a look at these and let me know if you have uh, any particular comments or questions or that. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for listening um, and for your attention. I hope that was clear to you. But if and if you have any further questions or anything was unclear, um, do let me know uh, in the Q&A. Thank you very much.